can see you. That is brilliant. <laughs> Hello and welcome. And I was wondering, uh, Ms. Ressa, if you could introduce yourself and Rappler, please, for the tribunal and the judges. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Maria Ressa. I've been a journalist for more than 35 years, so I'm, I'm old. <laughs> I started in 1986 in the Philippines. I actually worked for a government station that was just trying to figure out, you know, what coming out of almost 21 years of censorship was going to be like. So it was an amazing time. Uh, in 1987, I uh, helped start a company called Pro Productions. It was the first investigative news magazine program in the Philippines. Um, and around that same time, CNN asked me to start its bureau in Manila. Uh, in 1995, I moved to Indonesia. I opened CNN's Jakarta Bureau. That's where I covered, well, from there I began to cover kind of like this shift in Southeast Asia from authoritarian one-man rule. I that was uh, including near the end of nearly 32 years of Suharto's rule in Indonesia. At the end of 2004, I came home to the Philippines and headed the largest news organization, ABSDN, the same one that lost its franchise last May here in 2012. I started Rappler with three of my co-founders, all journalists about my age. Um, we hired the smartest 20-somethings we could find. Our elevator pitch when we were putting the company together is the, about the impact of journalism. It's this simple. We build communities of action. The challenge for us was how do we continue to hold power to account? How can we use technology to do that, to, to embrace it and to merge technology with the mission of journalism? To try to find the solution back then and today, we stick to our three pillars, technology, journalism, and community. Wonderful. And how, if you can just relate for the, for the tribunal, how did you and Rappler became under attack in the Philippines? Just walk us a little bit through that. Um, it, it's funny because it's very similar. I suppose funny is the wrong word, but it's very similar to how democracy in many parts of the world were also subverted. We came under attack in 2016 uh, because we challenged the impunity of two very powerful men in the organizations they ran, Rodrigo Duterte, the brutal drug war, and Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. We exposed the government's propaganda machine on Facebook in the same way we exposed the way the government of the Philippines was modifying the numbers of casualties in the drug war. Uh, we demanded accountability, an end to impunity, and that was where all our trouble began. We stuck to the mission of journalism, to the facts. Sorry, did I miss that? Sorry, that I was just a little. And then, um, what reporting specifically on the administration of Duterte or in the, the elections that brought him as, as president, uh, were you reporting, I mean, they got you guys in the situation, and how they retaliate uh, to you personally and to Rappler, please? Sure. Um, so first, let me just point out that the Philippines uh, is a first adapter to technology. We were known as the SMS texting capital of the world. And on social media this year, for the sixth year in a row, Filipinos spend the most time on the internet and on social media. That's from Hootsuite and We Are Social, those numbers. Um, Cambridge Analytica whistleblower Chris Wiley called us the Petri dish, where he said that the tactics of mass manipulation were, were tested here and in countries like Nigeria, countries in the global south where systems of accountability are weak. This enabled them to test with relative impunity and when those tactics work, they ported these over to the West. Um, I think the other part is that we're a rowdy democracy. We have press freedom, but at the same time, our institutions are weak uh, and corruption is endemic. Um, I was hoping that when we set up Rappler that we could use technology to help jumpstart development. And it actually worked from 2012 to 2016. I think until the American companies got too greedy. Um, when Facebook began instant articles in 2015, then the 
all the news groups came on the platform, but they didn't realize or didn't care about what the impact it would have on the global information ecosystem. The two stories we continue to cover that really led to the legal challenges. So first it was the weaponization of social media that enabled the weaponization of the law. Um, the first story I talked about this brutal drug war, casualties, you know, the, the first casualty in, in the Philippines battle for truth is exactly the number of people killed in the drug war because we watch that number shift in plain sight. The police beginning in 2016, a few hours after President Duterte took his oath of office, we had the first person killed. And then, you know, in our night shift, uh, we had only one team, but they would come home in those months in 2016 with at least eight dead bodies a night. Um, the police began reporting numbers that were alarming, reaching up to 7,000 until they realized that these numbers were also getting them criticized. And then in plain sight, in plain view, they began to atomize them and to change them. So instead of at least 7,000 people, they took out, they carved out something they called deaths under investigation, this kind of atomization, kind of characterizes the attacks on democracy. So, so you take out deaths under investigation and in plain sight by January 2017, it moved from 7,000 people to 2,000, a little more than 2,000 people killed. Rappler came under attack because we kept telling people the original number and how it was being changed and how it was being atomized. Um, the United Nations now says it's about 8,800. Uh, the police still stick to about 6,600. And yet human rights organizations say that in the first three years of the Duterte administration, at least 27,000 people were killed. That's an ongoing story. It continues. It has shifted. These tactics have shifted from the drug war. Now it's it's used these same tactics on social media, kind of bottom-up attacks on social media, top-down attacks by government have shifted to attack human rights activists. But the way it worked was um, anyone who questioned the brutal drug war in beginning in 2016, so it started with the citizens, they were pummeled on social media, on Facebook. Facebook is essentially our internet. 100% of Filipinos on the internet are on Facebook. Um, when they were pounded to silence, as we continued reporting what was happening and how these numbers were changing, we became targets of attack. So journalists next, and then opposition politicians after that. And then beyond that, then this kind of online violence occurring in an environment of violence and fear then seeped into the real world. Um, I'll, I'll mention one last thing, which is that, that there were cautionary tales that were set up, you know, in in business very early on, President Duterte attacked a businessman, Roberto Ongpin, who had a publicly listed company that affected the stock shares. He did it from the presidential pulpit. Right? He did it. Um, the second in politics is Senator Lila de Lima. She was the former head of the Commission on Human Rights uh, who investigated Duterte while he was still Davao mayor. Uh, she also was a secretary of justice. She has been in prison for plunder and drug charges that have never really been proven in court uh, since February 2017. And then finally, I'm the cautionary tale for journalism in the sense that in less than two years, I've had 10 arrest warrants Rappler has had nine legal cases filed against it. And that's where you call to use the law as a weapon against journalism. How was also social media used as a weapon? You also mentioned that against you and Rappler specifically. Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, uh, look, last week I testified at the UK Parliament about how on the online safety bill could be shifted. I think it is about how social media has become a behavior modification system. And we, the users, are treated in, in these online ongoing experiments like Pavlov's dogs. Uh, 
the, the biggest concern is really not content because that's where everyone gets lost. It is algorithmic bias and distribution. That's the problem. It's the same methodology, whether it's in the Philippines, the United States, Venezuela, Turkey, Brazil. You know, research has shown that lies laced with anger and hate spread faster and further on social media. This was published actually by MIT um, uh, on Science Magazine in 2018. These platforms grow through their algorithmic choices. And an example of one is using friends of friends as a basis of a, its recommendation system. When your personal accounts grow, the more friends each of us has, the more the platforms grow. And that's the same for all social media platforms. This recommendation algorithm has been A-B tested and it's based on friends of friends. That works the best. But, you know, this is a chapter that I'm actually writing about in the book. Friends of friends actually is the beginning of how democracy was broken. Um, this is what happened in the Philippines. In 2016, we were all in the center. We didn't debate the facts. You, we agreed on the facts. In, in May, after President Duterte won, he used that kind of polarizing us against them style of leadership. Uh, and then by using friends of friends, you know, if you're, here's the center, if you're pro Duterte and you can substitute any other leader like president, like Duterte, Trump, for example, if you're pro Duterte, you moved further right with the friends of friends algorithm. If you're anti Duterte, you moved further left. That's 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. So uh, you can see that that algorithm divides. Another algorithm that gives you what you see on your news feed radicalizes. Um, and what that does, this tearing apart of the public sphere, uh, allows these, these filter bubbles to create their, you know, this actually came from a White House spokeswoman, alternative facts. And when you have that, that system of micro-targeting is then exploited by power to insidiously manipulate people in a democracy. By design, the platforms, they divide and they radicalize. We've seen this globally, Oxford University this year, it's the Computational Propaganda Research Project, said that cheap armies on social media are rolling back democracy in at least 81 countries around the world. The, the problem, of course, is that online violence, so this is the way that works, is that when you're targeted, you're pounded. After we did the weaponization of the internet series, the, the founders of Rappler wrote it. I wrote uh, two of the three-part series. The first part was weaponization of the internet. The second, the slug in 2016, was how Facebook algorithms impact democracy. And the third was manufactured reality. We looked at a, a soft puppet, 26 fake accounts. And we manually counted how these 26 fake accounts could influence up to 3 million other accounts, right? Um, this, this created the enabling environment for the weaponization of the law. And what we've seen is democracy dying by a thousand cuts. The first cut the drug war, and then after that, then you see the attacks on the citizens, um, and then you see fear. Uh, I guess in the last thing I'll say is how the methodology works, right? Um, in in 2016, after we, we published the weaponization of the internet series, I was hit with at least 90, 90 hate messages per hour. It was like walking into a new world. I, you have no idea what is real and what isn't. And the end goal of all these attacks is to not just pound the target to silence, but also to create this kind of fake bandwagon effect, the manufactured reality that then lets everyone believe that you know, the, narr the meta narrative, for example, in my case is journalist equals criminal. You say that lie a million times, it becomes a fact. That comes bottom up. In 2017, President Duterte came top down using that same narrative in his State of the Nation address. It's kind of like our State of the Union. And he then says the same thing top down. And a about a week later, I got my first subpoena 
actor got its first subpoena in 2018. 11 cases and investigations were opened by the Philippine government against us. In 2019, the arrests began. My first arrest was in February of 2019. Um, and I spent most of 2019, 90% of my time dealing with the legal cases. Um, from then up until 2021. So I've received about, I've received 10 arrest warrants in less than two years. Uh, 20, in 2020, June 15th, I was convicted along with a former colleague of mine for cyber libel. Um, for a story that Rappler published in 2012, uh, I didn't write, edit, or supervise. Rappler was found innocent, but my colleague and I uh, were found guilty, and um, and I continued to fight this case in court. Uh, after that conviction, I then received a ninth and then a tenth arrest warrant in January this year. So it's it's very similar to what actually happened also in the United States with Stop the Steal. You know, it's the meta narrative was seeded a year in August of 2019, a year before the violence on January 6th. Uh, it was then picked up by Steve Bannon on YouTube, seated in closed pages, and then picked up by Tucker Carlson and Fox. QAnon drops it in October before it comes top down from President Trump about election violence. So you go in any country in, around the world, you can just see that the the cases, these types of the weaponization of social media creates this enabling environment that brings online violence into the real world. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. I think we, and I wanted to congratulate you for receiving the Peace Nobel Prize. I should have mentioned that for the record. <laughs> thank you very much.